nobody goes into the job market and thinks that painting is an option. They don't think about it. It's just something that nobody ever thinks about. And so they're here because they are they are trying anything <laughs> to figure out how they're going to survive in this, you know, tough and grueling capitalist society. That's where they're at. And you being a fast growing company and one of the best companies in the U S and, you know, do, you know, they, they don't care about that. They don't care. They, they care about their problems. Welcome to the painter growth podcast, where we help you scale your painting company in record time. Join us as we explore sales, marketing, hiring, finances, leadership, and more everything that you need to know to scale and grow your painting business. I hope you enjoy and subscribe. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Painter Growth Podcast. I'm Michael Hickman, founder of PainterGrowth.com. And today I am uh, have the pleasure of speaking with someone that a lot of you already know and a lot of you are already very familiar with, who always does the interviewing, but never, I mean, not as often gets interviewed. So really excited to learn more about Torlando and his business, uh, Craftsman, Craftsman, Incorpor Craftsman Painting. Craftsman Painter. 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 Okay. Yeah. We get to make sure I got that right. So Torlando, thanks for being with me, man. Absolutely. Thank you for having me on, Mike. So I, you had me on the painted podcast. We, we chatted in like March or April and uh, you were telling me in your business that things have grown to the point where you're not really responsible for the day-to-day -day operations. You're more responsible for the uh, just like recruiting and, and higher level stuff. So what is your current role in your business? Well, I mean, that fluctuates because at the, at the end of the day, when you, you know, are the, the CEO of the company, um, any number of hats that you've once delegated can shift back to you. Um, but, you know, primarily my role is to recruit and instruct. And so once we've, you know, got the team in place, um, you know, I, I, I've got to make sure that they know what they're doing, you know, at, at, at various levels and creating those um, you know, processes and channels and, and really principles that can help them be self-guiding. Um, so, so a lot of what I do is actually is very instructional. Um, and, and then if, if we need to fill in the gap with a, a delegated hire, I'm going to be actively finding that person and, and, uh, making sure that they are going to come in and fit our culture. So by instructional, that sounds basically like developing in people. Yeah, I'm a teacher. You know, I, I, I really, I really see myself as a teacher. That's awesome. So how long have you been running your business? So this iteration of the company is actually a, a, a fairly new startup. We're, we're in our first year. Um, prior to this uh, company, I was at a couple of different software companies. Um, I was at a, a company where I was the director of marketing and sales. Um, we are, we were fortunate enough to, to exit and, and, uh, have a be acquired by a, by another company, and then I had a, a stint as a, a chief marketing officer at another software company. Um, prior to that, I ran a uh, just a local painting company for about uh, about ten years, twelve years really, um, twelve years as, or two years as a sole proprietor, and then when I figured finally figured out a name for the company, it was another ten years of, of running that company. Okay, so you. You ran a small local company. You had a bunch of years in software and tech and marketing. And then you now started your business again. Just recently, you call it a startup. But I saw on your, uh, you know, your LinkedIn that you have desires to be a national brand. Absolutely. So yeah. what's, what are the main differences? I, I'm sure there are a lot of them. But like, what are the main differences that you're uh, using as an approach to start up this company round two? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think in in the first company, the the goal was really to grow my local business as large as I could manage it. And part of the challenge that I found ultimately with that with that model is that I live in a very small college town. Um, the you know the the type of painters that I like to hire, um, they tend to be you know younger folks that are either, you know, just out of college or, you know, maybe had a little bit of college and decided that it wasn't for them. Well, in this town, 
that's a fairly transient group. They're coming and going. And, and so retaining enough people and, and equipping them with the skills to be, you know, at their most profitable is, is actually pretty difficult here. And then, you know, to be honest, there are, you know, a handful of really quality painters in town and, and, you know, they know who they are. And they also know that there are a bunch of people that, you know, uh, they, they, they might be better off in another industry. And, uh, and so that talent acquisition, of course, you know, just, you know, when I look at the landscape of our population, the size of our town, um, I, I knew that ultimately if I was to get to, you know, I think, I think we, we had around 10 painters or something like that in the first company. And the challenge was uh, the bottom half of the, the group was so new, so fresh, and so transient that it was very difficult to, to sustain and manage and, to, and, and in many cases to have consistent profitability job over job. And so this time, the, the big change here is recognizing that, okay, my town is, is really good at importing young raw talent and training it and then exporting it and so can we leverage that was the question can we leverage the the vehicle that is a college town to create a little bit of a training center and then reach outwards geographically and create a, a bunch of little profit hubs where we're spreading our our mission we're you know filling the world with some painty goodness and we're bringing quality people into the trade and and to do that um you know our vision is really um a lot smaller even though it's big right it's it's small locations um that are that are smaller profit centers but very easily managed by a local team without you know too many uh, you know strains on on processes and resources um and then just kind of replicating that model uh, yeah, ideally a hundred times. Okay. So how many, how many pods do you have right now? So we're in, we're in three locations right now and we've got, uh, kind of two in the, in the wings that, um, we're, we're figuring out how, how's the best way to enter into that market. Okay. And what, just so we can kind of get a sense of scale, like what are the, um, so these are kind of like single crew uh, pods or are you thinking like two crews per pod? Yeah. So the idea would definitely be um, about two crews that range from two to three painters. And so being able to kind of, you know, flex with seasonality, um, yeah. get a little, you know, get one person as a summer helper, um, maintain four, you know, throughout the year. And we've kind of tweaked our, our commission ratios for salespeople and we've, tweaked our, uh, you know, our uh, uh, payouts for for the crew leaders in particular, so that with a very small crew, we can all be, you know, pretty profitable. Uh, but that does require us to be very lean. It requires a lot of effort. Yeah. And, uh, and not a lot of people have the, um, the ability to, to really kind of sustain that that effort based uh, work. What type of administrative setup do you need in each pod? Like assuming they're geographically diverse, you need a some sort of person to manage production and some person to manage marketing and sales. So how are you, you know, a lot of people have trouble managing just their own production, marketing and sales. Yeah. So how do you picture you being able to do this across many territories? Well, we utilize a lot of video. And so, um, you know, with our, with our framework for production, which... I uh, wrote a book about actually called Sprint. Um, we have these cadence of meetings that we run virtually where um, crews tune in on their phones, um, you know, salespeople tune in, maybe they're on their computer, maybe they're on their phone, but everybody tunes in for a daily standup uh, about 415 and we, and we hold each other accountable. Daily. Then, yeah. A daily wow. 15 minute. Yeah. So, so the whole, the whole Sprint framework, um, it's it's uh yeah it's kind of a line in that manner of let's let's try to have the most effective meetings that keep us all together 
um, but are also not standing in the way of production. So this is this is a daily meeting, but it's only 15 minutes. And if it's longer than 15 minutes, we're, we're doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. And we're just answering three questions. What got done? What's going to get done tomorrow? What blockers stand in our way? Yeah. And so with those blockers, any blocker that could be handled administratively, remotely, um, and, and there's a lot. You know, we can order paint remotely. We can close sales remotely. Um, we do a lot of virtual estimates. Um, you know, there's a lot that we could do virtually. And really being in the tech world kind of opened up my eyes to the possibilities. Because when I was in tech, I was selling across the world. You know, I was negotiating deals in, in Singapore and in the UK and, you know, <laughs> all, all over the world. And so I thought, oh, this has got to be possible. This has got to be possible. And a lot of it is is just, you know, with the pandemic and video opening up as such a common medium, um, people are very much uh, willing to have video calls. And so with the with the regards to the virtual estimates, um, we'll we'll do them uh, virtually. All we need is, is a few pictures and uh, maybe some video and we can put together a proposal virtually, have the conversation via video and, and sell that job. Wow. So definitely being creative. Um, I mean, the fact that you have daily meetings and most, paint, I, I would venture to say most painting contractors don't have any meetings with their team. Um, what type of, you know, what type of impact did you find on your business when you move to a daily, a daily huddle structure? Yeah. Um, well, there's the, the communication just increases tremendously and you have um, you have less of a question of what the heck's going on. You have less of a question of when is this job going to get done? Um, everybody's just kind of filled in and it's a it's a really old lift. And it's it's at the end. We do it at the end of the day um, as people are kind of as, as the crews are starting to clean up um, just so that they can they can give that accounting. Um, also because we're remote, the, the, one of the biggest challenges is staying connected as a team and, you know, keeping the morale up and, and being engaged. And, and that is not easy. You know, you know, we do face, um, conversations where people are feeling less engaged because of the, the remote structure. Um, it's, you know, it's not, I wouldn't say that it's rampant, um, but it is, it is a challenge, you know? And, and so, uh, doing things like, uh, you know, we decided, hey, we're going to we're going to throw a, a, a virtual game night and next month we're going to do Jackbox games, um, you know, as a team, but we're going to do it remotely. And yeah. hopefully this is a way that we you know, can reconnect. Um, I also will will go out and visit, you know, the different uh, locations and have um, what we call blitzes where um, we'll do a little in-person seminar. We'll rent out a, a, a space at a co-working um, center, and then we'll go out and, and maybe do some door to door or some ride alongs and, uh, and things of that nature. Yeah. And so that comes back to your role as, as teacher and educator and really integrator as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, there. I would tell you, Mike, there's a reason that not a lot of people are doing this. It's, it's hard. It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's not easy. And, um, like I, you know, like I think I told you before the show, I, I lost some money today, you know, and, and, and that's the reality of business, business ownership. I think a lot of, I think we see a lot of the success stories. People are very, you know, uh, proud of, of their successes and, um, you know, it's, it's, nobody really talks about the days that they, that they lose a ton of money. Well, that's your highlight reel. Right? <laughs> Instagram is your highlight reel and no one's going to be, you know, pushing out their worst days on, on Instagram or like no. the day where you're, you know, you wake up and your kids are bratty, you know, you're not sharing that with the world. Right. Exactly. Exactly. But, you know, I, I do believe that there's, uh, I actually believe there's more to business than, than money. Um, you know, obviously like, the goal of a business is to maximize profits. That's, you know, you know, that's business 101. Um, but I think you can very easily miss the forest for the trees on that one. Um, you know, with, with the paint trade in particular, um, you can have really great systems, but you have people and people are imperfect and things are going to happen. Mistakes are going to be made. Um, people are going to be discouraged. They're um, not going to have great days every day. 
And that means that the systems are not going to be ran every day. And so as a leader, um, you know, you, you really have to figure out a way to hold people accountable while keeping the, you know, the morale up. Um, and I think for me, a lot of that comes down to um, reinforcing strong principles and then kind of giving grace when, when it's needed, you know, being willing as a business owner to, to step in and, and do the dirty work. You know, when, when you were on my show, we talked about the, you know, $50 an hour work, $500 an hour work, $5,000 an hour work. Um, you know, sometimes in order to make your $5,000 an hour work stick, you have to do negative $50 an hour work yep. <laughs> because you want that person to stick around and, and you have to, you know, understand that every dog has his day. Um, but everybody, you know, everybody regresses to the mean, you know, after every good day, they're going to have an average day. And after, mm -hmm. after every bad day, they're going to have an average day. Yeah. I like to say that you have to earn the right to have $500 an hour activities and $5,000 in activities and like earning that right looks different to a lot of people in a lot of ways, but you do have to, you do have to earn it or else everyone would just go out and work a full day of $5,000 in activities and our activities. And, you know, and that is that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I want to push back on, on one thing that you said a little bit. Please. So maximizing profits um, and, and is obviously, you know, the main focus of business, but people miss the forest for the trees, like you said, but you know, if you're looking short term, like I, I need to maximize profits on this job, I'm going to do whatever it takes to make an extra 2%. I'm going to water down my paint. I'm going to pay my painters less. Like that is obviously, you know, not good to do. It's not ethical, but it does right. maximize profits. So the cynic would say that's in the best interest of the business because you're maximizing profits, but right. there's, there's, you know, there's the risk there. But if you look long term, how do you maximize profits? You have to keep your people happy. You have to provide amazing results. You have to get lots of you know, customer reviews. You have to have um, great culture and, and you know, have a great leadership structure. And ultimately, all of that, if you have happy customers and happy team members, that will maximize your profits long term. But a exactly. lot of people think short and medium term. That's that's exactly my point. You know, the the going, you know, going to going out and, uh, you know, being delivery boy. Um, yeah, every everybody online is going to frown upon that. Um, but sometimes you just have to have your your crews back. And mm. if getting them to just feel like they can get through this tough job means that you got to go to Lowe's and, and pick up some, you know, BS stuff and deliver it. And if they feel like a weight has, you know, been lifted or that at least that they know that their boss isn't just, you know, off sipping lemonade somewhere, but is like willing to help. Um, yeah, sure. You were working for free. Sure. You were doing a low level activity, but the impact on that person and that, that life, that's, that's ultimately what matters. I, you yeah. know, there, there are people right now that are, I've, I've been getting kind of frustrated online with some of the posts recently just about, um, you know, money. And, and I'm just like, this isn't the, the perp, like if the purpose of life is to just make money, then I, I, I don't, I don't want it. You know, like I don't, what's the point of life that why, you know, I, I get, I get a little nihilistic is the, or fatalistic. I get a little fatalistic sometimes, you know, but, uh, so what you're defining or describing, I, I spoke to Nick about on our episode quite uh, at length, and that's servant leadership, right? And it's leading yeah. from behind, doing what you have to take and doing what you have to do. And like you said, I think when we were just offline like that, when you're doing some of those things to boost morale, like you're, you're working that late night with your guys to help them get it done, like once in a while... Like, sure, yeah, you may be helping them with productivity and making a little bit better margins. But really what you're doing is you're providing your crew with that much value. And that could still be a $500 or $5,000 an hour activity because you're not going to lose that painter anymore. Correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and uh, I mean, the, the reality of the painting business, I, I think that, you know, some people come into the painting business with a with a professional sales background and they don't know what it's like to pick up a brush. They don't know how hard that work is. And it is, I think, frustrating for a worker to see the the people doing the $500 tasks and the $5,000 tasks 
um, you know, getting frustrated with, you know, what's going on, it can be demoralizing. It can be, it can be totally demoralizing to get sent back, you know, to a job site that has been kicking your butt for the last, you know, month and to realize that you got to redo it. Most of the time that's appropriate. Most of the time it's appropriate to send that person back to redo the work that, you know, that was not correct um, to, to give them that teaching moment. But if it is going to cross that line of a, a really great person um, going there and just, you know, resenting the project, resenting the work, they're just, they're just not even going to do it well. You know, they're not going to do it well enough to pass inspection and they're not going to be quick about it or they might, they might be too quick about it. And so sometimes it's just better, again, to give a little grace, be a team, send somebody in with fresh eyes, fresh legs, you know, give them a go at it, uh, you know, add training, reinforce principles, that kind of thing. And and just give that guy that, that you know, just had a bad job, just cut him, <laughs> cut him a little slack, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, leadership as a skill is so important for building any sort of organization beyond yourself. Um, for people who are not familiar with, you know, ever having had a good boss or followed a good leader before, how would you recommend someone get started on learning what the first steps are to become a good leader? You know, there's a, there's a, a study that was put out by, um, Yale's business school, uh, called the six domains of leadership and it's and it's structured like a pyramid this is a, a it's a scholarly article but you can find it on on google uh scholar it's, it's called the six domains of leadership and across these domains I, I i don't have my notes so i'm just kind of you know you know going off the cuff here but there's there are different types of leadership and the first one the first uh, domain of leadership is personal leadership and personal leadership is all about being an authentic human being, having values, having the ability to lead yourself and living what you are, what you are going to, to preach. Um, when people don't have an authentic leader, somebody who they feel like is a real human being, um, they they don't feel very connected to that person, and and they're not gonna they're not gonna last very long. And the thing is, is that you could you could have great strong morals, strong like you know personal leadership, but if you don't have a relationship with your people, then it then it instantly breaks down. Those are the first two things: having strong personal leadership, and then having relational leadership. If you, you, you have to build a relationship with your people, you have to know them, you have to know what are their desires? What are they, what do they want to, uh, what do they want to do with their lives? Um, I have a paint contractor friend in Indianapolis who's telling me that, uh, he, he sat around with his new crew members. He had some young guys on his team, a guy in his twenties, um, asked everybody, what, what do they want out of life? And he said, I want to be a millionaire, you know? And he said, well, I will tell you exactly how to do that. You backs out your 401k while you're young. And there's a 401k apply, right? He gave him a path. He, he understood what his goal is. And now he has the ability to have that relationship where he's going to coach him and nurture him and hold him, help hold him accountable to his path of becoming a millionaire one day. And, and there are others, you know, there's contextual uh, um, leadership where you give context for why we do what, what we do at Crafts and Painter. We believe painting makes a huge difference. And so our goal is to make a difference in the lives of our customers, our painters, our community. And we just kind of point back to that. Am I making a difference here? Do I feel like I'm making a difference here? If I'm not, then we got to fix something, right? That contextual, why do we do it? Why do people care about their house? Their house? Why are they getting it painted? Well, it's their most valuable asset. It's their most cherished asset and coming home to a house that it looks beautiful and that is a representation of who I am, that has meaning. That creates a space for cherished memories with family. That's why we do it. That's contextual leadership. There's inspirational leadership. There's, um, what else is there? There's a couple others. There's um, just creating a sense of safety. Um, you know, there's all these things. So I would start there. Um, 
study leadership, understand that, you know, the, the six domains of leadership are areas that we have to work on as leaders in order for our people to feel connected to us, to feel inspired by us and to, and to keep going. That was uh that was beautiful. <laughs> one, one, I think immediately actionable thing that most people could do is, is just understand what your painters want. You made a really good example there of, of them wanting to make a million dollars. And, you know, a lot of the time, if someone says, I want to make a million dollars, that you might just brush them off and say, oh, that's impossible. You never do that. Right. So this truly understanding what they want comes back to sales. Right. And so you need to consistently and constantly sell your painters into why they're going to spend their time with you. You say their house is the most valuable asset. I would say their most valuable asset is their time. Mm -hmm. Never get their time back. And so mm -hmm. your painters, your staff, your team members are choosing every single day to wake up and give you eight to 10 hours of their day. Mm -hmm. That is incredibly valuable. And people these days, lots of painters that I talk to say, I can't find any good people to work for me, blah, blah, blah. There's no good workers. Everyone's lazy. And right. I always push back and say, that's because you're not offering an opportunity. You're offering a $25 an hour paycheck with no upward mobility. Right. Right. So how do you structure your uh, employment roles to attract high quality people? Second part of the question, how do you sell them on your opportunity and, and, and encourage uh, retention? So, so when I'm recruiting, I, you know, I, it all starts with the job ad and the job ad is a message. You know, it's a, it's a signal. And a lot of times in messaging, whether it's, whether it's sales, recruiting, marketing, I refer to your message as a bat signal to the brand. Okay. So, so think of the bat signal, you know, mm -hmm. Batman, right? When uh, commissioner Gordon turns on that bat signal, who comes? Batman. The Batman. Yeah, the Batman comes. <laughs> Who runs away? The bad guys. The bad guys, right? Yeah. And so having a clear bat signal to your brand is, is where I start. And, and it starts with a message. And the components of a, of a good bat signal, it's not just the logo. Obviously, the, you know, maybe the, maybe the metaphor starts to fall apart here. But it's, it's what the... the the metaphor represents, right? It's what it's what Batman represents. He represents justice, you know. He represents accountability. He represents, uh, um, you know, cleaning up the city. You know, those those kind of things, right? What do you, what do you, what does your company represent? But more than what your company represents, what are you going to do for your people? For that person sitting across from you in the in the interview chair, they're not here on a whim they're not here because everything is right in their life they're here because they have a problem they're here because the job that they're at isn't what it needs to be they're here because they uh, graduated high school or they dropped out of college or they graduated college and they're not finding the opportunity that they thought they would nobody goes into the job market and thinks that painting is an option. They don't think about it. It's just something that nobody ever thinks about. And so they're here because they are, they are trying anything <laughs> to figure out how they're going to survive in this, you know, tough and grueling capitalist society. That's where they're at. And you being a fast growing company and one of the best companies in the U S and, you know, do you know, they, they don't care about that. They don't care. They, they care about their problems. And so until you start addressing their problems, then they're just not going to notice your, your bat signal. They're not going to see it. And so, you know, with, with our job ads, um, you know, we tend to attract a lot of artists and uh, part of that is because I went to art school. And and I and I know uh, personally how hard it is to graduate with a with a degree in art and realize uh, there are no jobs. Uh, you know, <laughs> the 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 unemployment rate of an artist is uh, roughly equal to to, you know, living in the Great Recession. And so um, you, you graduate, you don't know what you're going to do with your degree. You don't know how to make money. 
And so, you know, the message is, is simply that, you know, what are you, what are you, what are you going to do? You know, and you, you don't want to work at a computer desk. You don't want to wait tables. You don't want to uh, work at a bar. You want to work with your hands. You want to make something beautiful. You know, you want to provide value. Well, bring your talents to the paint trade. You know, that's the message. That's where we begin. And, uh, and, and I think that's, I think that's a great place to, to be in as, as good as any. Um, but we, we can talk about pay structure too, if, if that's, uh, interesting to you. Yeah. I mean, I, I do, I do want to talk a little bit about that. Um, cause that's so important and so many contractors struggle so much with, with, with pay structure and with margins. Um, but I want to just focus in on one part of that, which was, you know, the most important part. And, you know, we talked about earlier, understanding what your painters want, um, you, I, you creating your ad to speak to and solve their problems and not to solve your business's problems. So your business's problems are, I need a painter. I need mm -hmm. someone to work 40 hours a week and I need someone to produce this much with my customers so that I can make money. Right. Right. But their problems are, they don't know what they're going to do. You know, you, so, so, you know, your target demographic inside and out. Yeah. You're not saying I want a painter who has 10 years experience and I'm blah, 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 I don't care who I get. It's like, I want this very thin sliver of the population and I'm going to craft my ad towards them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely. And, and a lot of that is, uh, you know, it's, it's tuning into who I am and, and what I'm interested in because this is a, this is a people business. It's not a passive business. It's active. It's very, you have to be engaged as a leader. Um, so who do I want to be around? You know, who are my people? Um, I want to work with people that I, that I like, you know, and so to some degree I had to start there. Um, but I also, you know, took inventory of my favorite employees of the past. <laughs> I, I said, okay, well, who, who are my favorites? Who's, who's in my fab five and what, you know, what are their qualities? Well, a lot of them had, um, either, uh, graduated with, a uh, you know, kind of a, maybe like an associate's type degree or something like that or they had dropped out of college. Um, a lot of them have backgrounds in music or art. Um, you know, a lot of them are, uh, you know, diverse, um, you know, whether that be ethnicity, gender, um, uh, maybe they're part of the LGBT community, um, you know, so, I, so diversity seemed to be very important. And so uh, then I asked myself, okay, so where do these, you know, where do these folks hang out? Um, what messages, you know, would resonate with them. Um, and, and we just put that into the ad and, and then we try to make it as good of a place to work so that they would be willing to refer their friends. But I can tell you, Mike, is that in, in years where we were struggling with team morale, but we needed people, um, what my employees would say is, well, I can't think of anybody who would, uh, actually that I know that would actually have the work ethic to work here. That was BS. They, they didn't want to bring other people into the misery, you know, but when, when people are having fun and people are, are excited about the work and it doesn't feel like work, well, then all of a sudden it's easy to find friends because, because they want, they want people to join in. Yeah, that's huge. Um, I was actually, I had a different direction I wanted to go, but I want to, I want to stick on that for a second. What are some of the things that you have done to make your business a better place to work? Because a lot of painters might think, you know, when you say that, it's like, oh, they're going to on a site, they're going to paint a job, no matter what, that job needs to look the same. So the, the job is going to be the same. Um, and their experience is going to be the same. So this sounds kind of outlandish or whatever. So what have you done to improve that job experience for your painters to make them want to you know, enjoy work, like you said, not feel like work and refer their friends. Yeah. Um, well, you know, this is something that is just so difficult, you know, and, and, I, and I've probably screwed it up more times than, than I haven't. Um, you know, my, uh, my skills and, and interests are not, do not especially lie in like throwing together a, a, a team game night, you know, I'm not much of an event planner. So there are areas where I, I sincerely struggle uh, in this, in this regard. Um, I think that where, um, you know, where I make up for it is that I, I care about the people who work for me, you know, and, and I'm willing to have, you know, 
sincere conversations and I'm willing to check in with them um, and, and to see how they're doing. Uh, I, I do try to, to put a lot of effort into that personal development. And so making sure that they are uh, being instructed and learning new things and being appreciated. And I, you know, saying thank you, it's like, it's not hard, you know, just say thank you. Um, but I, but I'll tell you, somebody told me a long time ago, it's like, if you, if you can get two buddies on a crew, um, that, that work hard, uh, that, you know, you can really kick butt, you know? And, and so I think that's really what I've, you know, in spite of my deficiencies as a leader, I think what I've noticed is that if you get a group of guys that have fun together, you know, it's going to be easy. So, so a lot of it is just getting people who, who have a good time. <laughs> that's fair. I remember one thing that I did when I, I hired a bunch of painters. Uh, I think I had like, I was onboarding like six or seven painters at the same time. And uh, I invited them over for pizza one night and none of them knew each other. So they all came in and they're all just like quiet, you know, yeah, whatever. So I purposely went upstairs for like 20 minutes and I was just like out of the kitchen and they were just like all there by themselves. Yeah. And then like a couple of people started talking. And then by the time I came back down, everyone is just talking. It's loud. They're laughing. And sometimes that's all it takes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, breaking bread together is, is, uh, it's a really powerful thing, you know? And, and, uh, I, I read an article about, um, Greg Popovich, the, the, you know, NBA coach for the San Antonio Spurs. And he's a huge believer in the power of food. I mean, that guy never, he never has dinner alone. He's always got players together. He's always got coaching staff together. Um, you know, he, he, he never eats alone. And uh, and he really believes in the strength and the power of bonding together over food, and yeah. so um, and I'll and so I'll do that. You know, I'll I'll, I'll drop by and I'll uh, you know bring some drinks or something like that. You know, on the job site, anytime the crew doesn't have to worry about lunch, I think that's a good day. Yeah, you know, I used to do a biweekly. You know, it's not about me, it's about you, but uh, it's just making me think of this. I've never, I haven't shared this very many times, but. I used to do a uh, bi-weekly. So every two weeks we would do a breakfast on Friday mornings. We mm. get everyone together and we do a big mm -hmm. breakfast. We found this one joint that had like pretty reasonably priced breakfast. And there'd be like 12 or 14 of us. And we would all sit down. We'd all meet there at 7 a.m. We'd have breakfast. We'd let the customer know we're going to be a little bit later. This you know, it's Friday. And, uh, you know, we have breakfast. We'd chat. We'd have, we'd do uh, contests. We'd talk about like who was the highest producing painter and, mm -hmm. you know, have like kind of inside jokes among each other. And people... Like it was one breakfast every two weeks, but they really looked forward to it. And it was like a yeah. really special time for them. Yeah. You seem like you're good at that, like gathering people together. You know, you probably in college, you probably were the guy that, you know, threw the party, had had people at your apartment all the time. I uh, <laughs> I struggled. I, if I threw a party, uh, be, nobody came, but I would always <laughs> go to the party. I, <laughs> I always got the invite, but, I, you know, getting people yeah. together is always hard. So, so let's, um, you know, we have about 10 minutes left here. So I want to just get, get the people some rock solid stuff they can use. So what is the compensation structure that you're currently using for your, your painters that you find is motivating? Yeah. So, um, we're, we're an employee model. Um, we, uh, we use a, a PEO, um, which I, which I highly recommend, especially for folks who are, kind of stuck between that, you know, do I subcontract? Do I employ? They like the ease of subcontracting. They hear so many people doing well with subcontracting, but they don't like the lack of control. They don't like the, the uh, lack of, you know, deep team integration. Well, using a PEO is kind of the best of both wor worlds. In terms of a, a single line item, you just, you pay the PEO and, and they, pay all the payroll taxes and the, you know, mm. workers comp and all of that. What does it's PEO stand for? Professional employer organization. And, and okay. if anybody has a question about that, feel free to reach out to me. I, I'd love to, you know, I'm, I'm really a champion of the PEO. I love, I love PEOs. Okay. Um, but you, but you get to pay the, the employees get paid like employees, but you pay the PEO just like almost like a subcontractor. Yeah. And so you get the best of both worlds out of it. So we have, we have an employed model and, um, you know, we do use, uh, we, we do use some cash incentives for production, but you have to be careful with cash incentives because, you know, where you put your money tells people where your priorities are. And so if your priority is production and speed, it means that 
quality goes by the wayside. So you have to be very careful about that. And so we have kind of a, you know, we're, and we're always trying to develop this, but we have, you know, checks and balances in place. We've got, you know, rewards for um, reviews and that kind of thing. We do shout outs and stuff like that. We, as a culture, we promote quality, but we do have a little bit of that cash incentive. So basically how it works is that everybody gets paid um, a base hourly rate. And this base hourly rate is intended to be a very comfortable pace so that when they're producing the, their, their production rates, they should be very easily attainable. That's, and that's the key. And, and, you know, we probably have some folks that their, you know, their base rate is, is maybe slightly above and it's hard to, it's hard to adjust, you know, you know, after the fact, but um, the, the, the idea is you give them a base rate that is going to make their uh, production rates easily attainable. By the way, in our, in our system, we recognize that painters paint at different speeds and that and that to me is the one missing link that the entire painting industry is missing is how do you accommodate for people painting at different speeds and so everybody has an individualized production rate target and we make it really simple for them to know how they're doing are they on track okay and so if they produce above their production rate, um, we give them the money that they would earn if they were earned, if they were getting paid at a, at a higher scale. Um, that base pay acts as a safety net. So, you know, if something goes sideways on the job, um, they're not making below minimum wage or anything like that. They're going to they're going to hit their safety net. They're going to mm -hmm. hit the base pay. And, uh, you know, and, and the comp we're just going to have to you know make it up on the next one. Um, but that's, that's how we do it. And so each painter has, we have different levels. Okay. So if you're an apprentice, you start off as apprentice one, you're there for about three months, learning the ropes, figuring out the basic skills. We want you to produce a certain, at a certain production rate. Once you're there and you've learned those skills, you advance to apprentice two. That's another three months. At the end of that six month pe period, you're evaluated for your apprentice three, where you'll spend the rest of the year. So you have a, a one year apprenticeship. And then after that, you progress to journeyman one, and then journeyman two, journeyman three, then up to craftsman one, craftsman two, and then master craftsman. And so at each of these levels, we have a transparent hourly rate as a base for each of those levels. But no matter what level you're on, if you are producing above your target production rate, you're going to get paid as if you were, uh, you know, a, a higher producer. So you have these nine internal categories. Mm -hmm. Correct. Wow. And so it's you have, I'm assuming, a clear uh, uh, structure on what someone has to accomplish in order to move up to the next level. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, what we what we do is we we equip all of our painters with this uh, this um, daily planner. And in the planner, there's, you know, there's, you know, stuff to keep track of your day and write down what you did and, you know, calculate your production rates. Um, but at the beginning of the planner, and this happens to be the one for the salespeople, but, you, you know, nobody's gonna be able to see it anyway. But at the beginning, we have those principles, we have our workflows, we have um, the, you know, the, the ladder of, you know, climbing up, we have all of that in place. And so every day they take their planner to work and we, you know, we review this stuff regularly. And, That's and a it's cool idea. Yeah. Oh, they, they've been working really well, actually. Yeah. Um, you, you have to, you have to use them, you know, because if you don't use them, it's not going to, you know, it's not going to matter, but it's just yeah. like any process. Um, but yeah, and then this, this is a cool thing that we did recently. We put our review link and so, cause we want to incentivize quality. And so we put the, the QR code for our review link and a, a quick prompt. It says, did we do a nice job? Give our crew a five-star review and the company will tip us each $20 on your behalf. Right? So we want to, we're trying to do our best to incentivize because that's the tough thing with cash incentives. Again, where you put your money is where uh, your, your, your employees think, man, I right? love that concept. <laughs> I've never heard of it done that way before. And that is such a cool way 
instead of giving the customer a discount on their job, telling them that the company will tip them an extra. So there's no, there's no external motivation for the customer to give that review. It's just, do you think the painters deserved it? Yeah, it's goodwill, you know, and, and I, yeah. and I, th I think that people will be, you know, people are willing to do it. Yeah. Well, there was a lot more that I wanted to go through today with about your interview process and your training process and, and all of that, but we ran out of time today. So no doubt we will have to do a round two. Sure. But uh, thanks so much, Torlano. That was a great conversation. It was great to get to know uh, the man behind uh, Paint Dead a little bit more. Absolutely. Uh, it's it's been a pleasure person. being on. Yeah, for sure. Sweet, man. Well, we will see you. We'll talk before then, I'm sure, but we'll see you at the expo. All right. Sounds good. Thanks for listening to the Painter Growth Podcast. If you want to grow your painting business, go to www.paintergrowth.com or click on the top link in the description. Talk soon.